What's up, everybody? Hi. So how many of you came tonight just to see what would happen? I mean, we've prayed over everything. Sue's so funny, she was like, I'm preparing you tonight. I'm not sure how to work it, but I would figure it out. If you weren't here last week, the power went out and it, it fried one of the things to the soundboard and so there was no microphone and this little guy got squirrely on us. And, but it was a good time. And I will say that, oh, you guys are, oh. I have a lingering cough, um, but we're prepared. We have a plan. Um, last week, who could have prepared for that? You just don't know. Um, <clears throat> I tell you that I have, don't know that I've ever been around a group of women that are so hungry for the word that you just like take a licking and keep on ticking. And you're just like, power out, we don't care. No microphone, we don't care. She's hacking up a lung, we don't care. <laughs> I really do appreciate y'all. There's so much encouragement um, in gathering together and hearing the word and focusing in, even through distractions and even through opposition, which is kind of funny because that's what running our race is all about. There will be, op there's opposition to you living the life that God has called you to. It's, it's not always easy. It's not always um, just super uh, simple, but it's always worth it. It's, it's worth it because of what we're called to. So I'm gonna pray and we'll get started. Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you for this group of women. Thank you that we are on this race together. We each have our own race, but we, we can be cheerleaders to one another and we can be helpers to one another and we can learn the word together and we can grow together and I'm thankful for that. I do pray for my human body. Lord, let your word go forward. Um, calm this cough, let your word go forward because we have this promise that when the word goes forward, it always accomplishes the thing which you send it for. And you're sending it to encourage us tonight, to teach us so we can be more like Jesus. I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're gonna read our scripture that we're working off of. Hebrews 12, one and two. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So to recap, the race is our life. It's not like an exhausting <sighs> race. And we talked last week, run with endurance really means a cheerful, hopeful constancy. So it's not like, I gotta get there, I gotta get there. It's like, <laughs> one of those. I, I imagine if I ran a race, I would be like that, but that's why I don't run a race because I feel like it wouldn't be that way. But the first week we talked about how we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. We wanna run with the runners. We wanna run with the people in the word of God, the, the, the saints of old who ran their race, the people in the word of God who ran their leg of the race and now they're looking out over us and they're saying, go girl, you can do it. Like I had the hand and the baton off. And then we talked about how it says, lay aside every weight and the sin and how that's about connectivity. And if we're always connected to the weights and the sin, it's gonna hinder us, it's gonna slow us down, it's gonna make us sluggish, we're not gonna get to where God has us to get. And then last week we talked about the endurance part and one of the things we said was you can't run a race looking backwards. And so I hope that if you struggled with shame or regret, that was broken off of you last week. You don't ever have to look back at that because Jesus said he has set you free and he has forgiven you. And at the same time that you, that you don't look back, you reach forward toward what's ahead, and that's an exciting thing. And we talked about the tambourines. Get your tambourine, girl. We're gonna end tonight with the same song we tried to end with last week. We're gonna redeem that sucker, but that's for later. So tonight, run with endurance the race that, notice that wording, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us appointed to us, destined to us is what that means. In other words, I have a race that is set before me. You have a race that is set before you. 
my race is not your race and your race is not my race. And we get into trouble when we try to run someone else's race. This is so important that we're gonna spend two weeks here. Tonight we're gonna be talking about acceptance and accepting our race. Next week is more of a confidence to run your race. I believe that confidence is a skill. It's not just something, you know, that commercial. Maybe she's born with it. Maybe it's Maybelline. <laughs> Sometimes people think you're born with confidence. It's just something. But, but godly confidence comes from getting to know God. When you get to know God, you get to know yourself because you get to know the one who made you. So you get to know how he made you. Therefore, you have confidence. So therefore, I believe it's a skill, but that's for next week. I'm getting ahead of your, myself. Tonight, it's about acceptance. Accepting who God made you to be, how he made you to be, the race that he set before you, the season that you're in. And it's about valuing those things. To illustrate, the, the ladies that I've talked to, they're gonna um, come and do a, a super fun illustration. Because this is what, come on up, don't be shy. So this is what many of us do. Yeah, pa take one down, pass it around. Wristbands, come on over and get them. You guys come get them. So while they're preparing, I mean, I hope you have your cameras ready, come on. I'm gonna move my stuff. This is just to burn in your brain what we do. Because many, if not most of us, We'll do this on um, daily, weekly, monthly, yearly basis. Oh, they're giggling. Can you hear them? Don't laugh too hard or you'll be next week. Okay, y'all ready? So, okay. So, see, they all got their headbands and their wristbands on. Come on. Don't be shy. Come on up. Come on up. Okay. So, they're, at the, they're ready. Like, they're ready to run their race and they're, they're ready to go. And then, okay, so you ready? Get set. Can you guys see? Okay, run your race, girls. Run your race. What? Wait, wait, no, no, no. Run your race. Wait, what are y'all doing? No, wait, wait. Oh, Melissa's going the wrong way. Okay, no, oh, Danielle's cutting off Melissa. Oh, no. No, no, y'all are supposed to go, no, that way. That, y'all don't even know where you're going. Y'all don't even know where you're going. <laughs> Isn't that a good illustration of what we do? Ideally, yay, y'all are good. Yay, thank you. Ideally, they would be running together and, and, and we would all be like, hey, good job, good job. But so many times we trip up, we can't run our own race, we're falling. They were supposed to go that, they couldn't even go the right way because they're not looking where they're going because they're looking at someone else. Sometimes we look at someone else in judgment We've got our eyes too much on somebody else thinking, what are they doing? If you ever come up to me and say, did you see how she was dressed? Jason calls it the spirit of slap. <laughs> spirit of slap will come upon me. Like, why were you looking? Why were you looking? Like, you don't know. You don't know. Stuff like that. We're looking at people like, did you, blah, blah, did you? Well, no, look, look, you're not supposed to be looking at her. You're supposed to be looking at your own race. Or often, more often probably, we look at somebody and be like, man, she's running better than me. Man, she's running faster than me. She's got fancy shoes and good footwork. I bet she's going to make it before I make it. I bet she's going to win an award that I don't win. It's, I hope that when you think stuff like, when you think stuff like that, you'll, you'll see the ladies who love you so much, they'll be silly for you. And see how silly that is. If you actually saw that in a race, you would be like, you're not doing it. No, no, sweetheart, stop. Let me show you. Because you would want to help. Help yourself. Run your race. So acceptance is accepting the race that is before you. Again, not the same one that's before me. When I get to heaven, God is not going to say, Raina, how well did you run Brooke's race? Did you complete all the things that I called Brooke to complete? No. He's going to say, Raina, what did you do with the life that I gave you? What did you do with the gifts that you were given, the talents that you were given? There's going to be a judgment seat for people who, uh, whether we know Christ or not, 
And then there's going to be a reward judgment. And judgment maybe is not the right word, but a, re a reward seat for when God says, this is what I called you to. And he's not going to hold you accountable to things that you weren't called to. So there's no reason to be focused on somebody else's footwork that's called to something different than you. So accepting the race that is set before you, accepting how God made you. I read a, something that changed my life. Mercy, it's probably been 20 years ago. At least I taught this at Glow a lot. Um, and it was an author called, uh, named Linda Dillo, and she had a friend that said to her, you know, we're all different. Some of us can do a one-ring circus, some of us can do a two-ring circus, and some of us can do a three-ring circus. And she said how much that freed her, and I found that that freed me too because I'm a one-ring circus all day. I'm a one-ring circus. I have a limited capacity. I look at my husband, and I'm like, how? How do you do all this stuff? Well, that's his capacity. I have a different capacity. I have a, I, I can't run, you know, all these things at all the times. Just, just the one plate. I can spin the, the one plate. I'm pretty good at that. Once I start being like, oh, she's got two. Maybe I could, nope, 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 just the one. <clears throat> if you think about the parable of the talents, and, and the, you know, when Jesus told this parable and he said, God gave them the talents according to their ability. And he made them. So he knew their ability. We feel like God must be disappointed in us because we're not able to have as many talents as that person had. Well, that's how God made them. God gave them that according to their ability, according to their capacity, which he made. So when I get into an arena where I think, oh, I, I think God must be disappointed in me because I can't do what she can do. I can't spin all the plates she can spin. I can't tame all the circus animals that she can. Then I'm way off into an arena that the devil has me in because God made me with my special capacity in this special time, in this special season, and he knows what he has given me in this time, that's what I'm to be faithful to. I'm not to be faithful to her circus. I'm not to be faithful to her circus. I'm to be faithful <laughs> to my own circus, which is circus, which is a circus. And then you gotta accept what season you're in. That's a big deal for us ladies. You know God made all the seasons, and isn't that a good lesson? I love spring. We don't, you know, have a lot of that here, but I remember it from Tennessee. Spring when everything's just new. And then summer, you get to go to the beach and it's just so fun and school's out. And, and that's such a fun thing and barbecues. And then fall, again, not much here. I fake it at my house. We just plug in some fall scent and like put pumpkins up like we live somewhere else. Um, I made soup this week and it was like 80 degrees and I'm like, we're eating the soup. I don't care what's happening, we're eating the soup. But fall's so beautiful in many places and the leaves change and then winter is such a, like a cozy time and such celebration and God made all of that on purpose. And if we could view our lives like that and not be in the fall of life thinking only about spring or be in the summer of life thinking only about fall or winter, it would do us good. It would be encouraging to us. You know, if you've heard people talk about Christianity as an adventure, you've heard me say it, like, this is an adventure. We have, this life that we live is an adventure, and, and you have found that not to be true, and you think in your heart, Man, I keep hearing everybody say that, but I just have to tell you that I have not found that to be the case for my own life. Then I'm gonna challenge you tonight that maybe you're looking at somebody else's adventure and you're not really living your own adventure because when you accept your race, when you accept the particular season that you're in, when you accept the particular uniqueness and capacity that God has for you, and you learn who you are through him, it is the greatest adventure. And if you can let go of always looking to somebody else to see how they're running, to try to copy their footsteps, you're gonna have the greatest adventure of your life. And it's gonna be a big deal. When you do accept those things, your uniqueness, your season, 
your race, God can open doors and put you before people that they stop and look at you and they say, how in the world are you doing that? Many of you know that, um, you know, my story, and if you lined up 100 women and say, I want you to pick who would you think the best person to be a pastor's wife? I'd be the last one picked, truly. You know, I'm a, I'm a high school dropout. Um, I got pregnant at 16 with Chelsea, and it, yes, it is Jason. So I always have that question, like, <laughs> whose baby is that? It's, <laughs> your pastor got me pregnant at 16. Um, <clears throat> So I'm a, we met when I was 15, and that's about how that went. Um, like, and I've told you before, I was just 100% heathen before I came to know Christ, which is all that you think it is. And, and so my, like, bio, my resume ain't looking that great. But that's what God loves to do. He loves to take what the world says, no, 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 and just show off. He loves to show off. You know, according to my history, I could never be a great wife. According to my history, I could never be a good mom. I could not be a good gaga, grandma. I could never be those things. God doesn't care about your history. He only cares about what he's put in you, how he's able to shine through you, and whether you're letting him do that. I want people to look at my life and say, wow, only God could have done that. And I hope people look at your life and say that too. So 2 Corinthians 10, 12 and 13 from the Amplified Classic says, "When they, this is, this is um, Paul talking and he's talking about another group of people, but it's so, um, it, it's so good for us to learn wise behaviors and unwise behaviors. When they measure themselves with themselves, and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding and behave unwisely. We, on the other hand, will not boast beyond our legitimate province and proper limit, but will keep within the limits of our commission, which God has allotted us as our measuring line, which reaches and includes even you. So it is unwise to measure yourself to other people. It is unwise to... To, because God has allotted you. I'm the exact height of a measuring tape, by the way. I have heels on, so you can't tell, but. It is unwise for you to always take your measuring line, and, and we're gonna illustrate this more later, to put it up against other people. The Bible says that it's, it's that first part says, <laughs> without understanding, if you're always going, do I measure up to you? Do I measure up to you? Instead of, this is what God has allotted me, I'm gonna pay attention to this. I'm gonna make sure that I measure up to how God made me. I'm gonna make sure I make him proud of, of the way that he made me and I shine his light. Then, um, then you're behaving wisely <clears throat> and with understanding. Many of you won't get this because you're not from the South. But if you're from, and it'll be an education for those of you who <laughs> are maybe curious or have family in the South. Um, it may be not like this today, but 25, 30 years ago, if you wanted to be a pastor's wife, there were certain things that, you, that needed to be done. You needed to be able to play that piano. <laughs> Organ, if they had one, both at the same time. You needed to be able to sing and lead worship. You needed to be able to put together a choir and make that happen. We were laughing so hard last week after everything that happened. And Brooke said, the craziest thing is you led worship. <laughs> if you weren't here, we had to sing with no music. No. Um, so I fulfilled that check. Yep, that's me. I can do that. So when I went in, stepped into the role of pastor's wife, which is a calling on me, a calling for my life, because I'm married to the dude who's a pastor, not that there's a 
pastor's wife calling, like you gotta go out and catch you a pastor so you can be a pastor's wife. <laughs> I used to get so tickled at people introducing me like that. It's okay if you do, it's, it doesn't bother me. I just get tickled about it because I never heard anybody say, and this is my electrician's wife, and this is my plumber's wife, and this is, this is my whatever. Um, but when I measured myself against that criteria, I felt insufficient. And I was insufficient because I didn't, God did not place that in me. Listen, if God wanted me to sing, he would have put it in me to sing. If God wanted me to play, play the piano, he would have given me that gift. He didn't. I'm not, so I have the choice then, stepping into that role of pastor's wife, am I gonna feel insufficient because of what he didn't give me? Or am I gonna step into who I am to what he did give me? I have a lot of great qualities. I feel like one of the best ones is I show up. <laughs> Listen, I love people who show up. I love, I love, I mean, you know, I know that that's not like the sexiest trait there is, like, you know, but that's a big deal. Um, I have a, a lot of good things. I don't know if y'all have ever heard my thing about the most important thing, the number one job of a pastor's wife that I do is I sleep with the pastor. <laughs> That's the number one job. Nobody else can do that. I'm the only one in the whole world who can fulfill that call. So I make sure that that's, that's a, that's, I make sure I'm really good at it. <laughs> Somebody said, oh boy. <clears throat> it's okay if you need to leave. I know you don't wanna hear about that about your pastor. <clears throat> if I spend all my time Man, I can't sing. I can't play the piano. Man, I can't, I can't leave that choir. I can't fill in the blank, fill in the blank. And, and your, your circumstances are different than mine, but you have those kind of things. You have some kind of expectations in the life that you live. Well, well, the she does it this way. She does it this way. If you spend all your time looking at the she does it this way or she is, she's gifted in this arena, how come you're not gifted in that arena? Well, God didn't make me gifted in that arena but I'm gonna be the best me that I can be. When it's time to show up, I'm gonna show up good. When it's, when it's time for, for me to be who I'm called to be, I'm gonna show up in that because I wanna give God glory in that. God is so big and so spectacular and so magnificent that it takes all of us to show his characteristics. It takes, it's not just like one person. Jesus was the one person. You are not Jesus. <laughs> you can be like Jesus and you can imitate Jesus. We talked about that. And you can make Jesus your role model in everything you do, like Peter said. But you're, you're not the Messiah. <clears throat> so it takes all of us to show a different kind of characteristic. Like, oh, God is so faithful. You know who reminds me of God's faithfulness? So and so. Oh, God is so kind. You know who reminds me of God's kindness? Oh, so and so. And, and that's how the body of Christ is meant to work. Every person being them, their own selves, not like XYZ, not like ABC, but by but who God made you so you can show forth God's character in that and, and how he made you. I wrote in my notes, let's make dad proud. Right? If you will be you and stop worrying about what you're not, what you weren't given, what capacity you don't have, and you just think, I'm just gonna be the best me that I can be for his glory. Man, that makes dad proud. That makes God proud. It makes him happy. Galatians 5, 25 through 26 in the Amplified. If we live by the Spirit, Holy Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. If by the Holy Spirit we have our life in God, let us go forward, walking in line, our conduct controlled by the Spirit. That goes back to what we talked about, spirit, soul, body. Let us not become. So this is a becoming. It doesn't always happen in an instant. Let us not become vainglorious and self-conceited, competitive and challenging and provoking and irritating to one another, envying and being jealous of one another. At the end of the day, comparison is just self-focus. How do I appear? How do I look? 
How do others see me? <clears throat> when you're looking around at everybody else and like newsflash, 99% of pe other people are also looking around at everybody else. They're not even looking at you. <laughs> then you've got this horizontal focus, just like our illustration. You've got this horizontal focus. I'm always looking here. And if we're led by the Spirit, then we should have a vertical focus. How am I doing, God? Am I, am, I, am I shining your light, God? Am I showing your character, God? I should have this horizontal focus. <clears throat> and that's the beauty of your race. That's getting to know who God made you to be. That's getting to know your destiny, your purpose. And your race is always purpose-minded because it's always about the kingdom of God. It's always about advancing God's kingdom. It's always about bringing God's kingdom here on earth. So when you have that vertical focus, that's how you can run your race. If you have that horizontal focus, man, you're gonna trip every time. Because either you're gonna feel, you know, your chest is gonna puff out a little bit like, well, I'm not doing as bad as her. <laughs> I might not be the best, but. <laughs> or you'll just be withering because you're like, everybody seems so much better than me. Everybody seems to have more capacity than me. She has a neater gift than me. I wanna stop here and say this. This is not just a pep talk. I, I'm the first in line, I love pep talks. You see me, I want you to give me a pep talk. I see you, I hope I give you a pep talk. But this is not that. This is not just like the world says, well just be you, just be you. We talked already about the heart's deceitful above all things, if you follow your heart, it's gonna lead you some places that are not on your race. So I'm not saying just be you, I'm saying be the you that he made you to be. That's the adventure. That's the fun. That's the race that you want to be on. Be the you that he made you to be so that he can be honored. He wants to make his name great on the earth. And he wants to make his name great on the earth through you. You, all of you, if I could just like open your eyeballs and like look you eyeball to eyeball, every one of you. He wants to make his name great through you. And the only way that he can do that is if you are the you that he made you to be. So consider the scripture from the message, Matthew 5, 14 through 16. <clears throat> Here's another way to put it. This is Jesus talking. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We're going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. If I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm gonna hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you there on a hilltop on a light stand, shine! You want a one word mission statement? Shine, shine. Keep open house, be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. It says he's not gonna hide you under a bucket. And he doesn't want you to hide yourself under someone else's skin, under someone else's gifts, under someone else's calling. And I love how it says, you're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in the world. If you've ever studied like precious gems and diamonds, you know that they reflect like different things. And so, I mean, a good question to ask yourself, what if you were meant to be like, like the most beautiful, I'm sure there's like, specific names for a type of purple. But like, what if you were meant to be like, like your shirt is so beautiful, purple. Um, that color. And then, but you spend all your life trying to be the green of the girl next to you. But you're not, so, but you're not, you're meant to be this exquisite gem. And you're not shining the right thing because you're hiding yourself under someone else. Someone else's colors or callings are all the things we've been over. You can't follow people, you have to follow the plan. Here is a great question to ask yourself if you find yourself comparing yourself to somebody or like one of our ladies who's looking at somebody else. A good question to ask yourself is, what am I valuing about that person? Now, this could be anybody in your life, somebody that you know, your neighbor, somebody on social media, somebody on the television, somebody on a stage, just, Anybody that you compare yourself to, 
What am I valuing about that? And if you're really honest, sometimes it's just silly. Our culture is a great example of that. <clears throat> if you've turned on the TV anytime to, and, and there's some women of a certain age, I want to be kind, but you look and you're like, what happened? What happened? Because it's, they don't look like themselves anymore because they're chasing youth. It's a joy to get older. I'm, I'm 49, so, I mean, you know, ask me next year, but <laughs> so far, I mean, there's some things I don't like about it, obviously. S sagging stuff. <laughs> some wrinkles, you know. The gray hair, it's fighting a losing battle at this point. I'm just like, well, there it goes. We're done. <laughs> so some things like that. But if I'm envying someone, comparing myself to someone, jealous of someone, say, in this culture, because of their youth, that's just silly. I have so much wisdom to offer now that I didn't have 20 years ago. It's a big deal. A lot of times, we envy, jealous, compare ourselves to someone who is maybe has a body that's different than ours. And if you really stop and think about it and say, what am I valuing about that? And you answer honestly. And you say, well, I, I value that flat tummy. Well, that's just silly. I've, I have been with people, and I'm, I'm uniquely positioned to talk about this because I know that you can look down your row and be like, man, look at her. She's got all her life together. And man, everything's just going perfect in her life. And I'm in the unique position to be not telling you because it's private information, but to know information that's like, you have no idea what's going on with her. You have no idea what her struggles or challenges are. You have no idea. Um, but obviously, I can't tell you that. But I, I've also been with a lot of people on their deathbed. It's just a part of the way of our job and calling. I've never once heard a woman say, Raina. I never got that flat tummy, and I just regret that. I never once heard somebody say, man, I really wish I would have been more famous. What you hear in moments like that, if there is regret, and I hope there's not, that's the whole reason we're doing this, is so that you won't have regrets, right? But the things that I hear and that I learn from are, you know, I could, have, I could have shared God's love more. I could have been more present more. Those are the kinds of things on your race that you should be focusing on and not looking at somebody else. So I have found that when I am, when I do look at somebody else and be like, oh, wow, I kind of wish I was more, I stop and say, what, Raina, what's your value? You need a value shift because that's a stupid value. That's a stupid value. Don't value that. Just because the world values that, don't value that, Raina. That's how I talk to myself. <clears throat> it's an honorable thing to do anything for God. You know, the enemy will always try to get you to say, well, look at what I'm having to do in this season. I I'm in a season right now where I'm doing some stuff that I never thought I would do. But if I start to say, look what I'm having to do, she's not having to do that then it gets me, again, that horizontal focus. And what happens when we do stuff like that, the enemy gets us so off focus. We, we stumble, we fall, but also we wanna fast forward. And I know if I asked you to raise your hand, everybody would raise your hand. Has there ever been a season of your life that you wanted to fast forward to the next season? Yes. But the thing is, God's teaching you in this season. God's giving you things that you need to learn. God's building those spiritual muscles in this season. God's, take, God's growing your character in such a way that when you get to that place when your gifts are in full operation, your character can keep you. There's been a lot of times where I've arrived in a season because I fast forwarded the last season that I wasn't prepared for. My gifts were there, but I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to carry the things because I missed what I was supposed to learn 
Don't miss what you're supposed to learn in this season, even if it's a hard season. And I'm not minimizing a hard season. I, 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 you know, we rejoice with those who rejoice and we weep with those who weep. If you're going through a hard season, I can just tell you, if you don't quit, you can't lose. Hang on. Uh, but you're learning stuff in this season. You're learning stuff that you can reach back to other people who are behind you in the race and say, come on, sister, let's go. You can make it through this. I can pull you through this because I got the spiritual muscles now. I've got the strength that I didn't have in that last leg. But in this leg, I got that strength to put you on my back if I need to and carry you through this leg. I can give you what you need. So don't miss what's in this season for you. You know, I... If left up to me, if I were God, obviously things would be a lot different and the world would be in shambles and chaos. So praise the Lord. But one of the things I think, I would not think that for the job of Messiah, that carpenter would be a good trainer, good training ground. He's gonna be the Messiah, let's make a, him a carpenter for 30 years. What? That doesn't make any sense to me. But God, in all of his wisdom, chose to send Jesus at that time in that land to his people and had him to be a carpenter's son and, in turn, a carpenter. And for most of Jesus' life, he was a carpenter. How was that good training for Messiah? I don't know. I don't know. I just know that that's where God had him. I can't imagine Jesus ever looking to be like, that rabbi doesn't have to do that. <laughs> of course, he's no ordinary rabbi, but you're no ordinary you. You're not ordinary. You, you're, you're learning things, growing muscles, be, becoming something that's so beautiful. And you may be sitting there right now thinking, why am I having to be a carpenter? I'm supposed to be whatever. The way to grow through that, learn through that, adventure through that, is, Lord, this is where I am. What, what do I need to be learning? I'm not looking here. I'm not looking here. I'm just looking here. What do I need to be learning, Lord? <clears throat> you know, Jesus being a carpenter, that's not great by the world's standards especially in his day, it was common. Being great is being faithful in the now. Being great is a life of faithfulness. Being great is showing up as you so that you can shine those God colors out. <clears throat> Let me give you two quick examples that help me when I struggle with things like this. The first is David and Saul's armor. And this, it's all coming up on the screen um, from 1 Samuel 17, 32 through 40, but I'm just gonna tell you. So this is when David, from the Bible, is fighting Goliath. Almost everybody, even people who don't know the Lord, know about David and Goliath. So David um, goes out and he knows that he's gonna kill Goliath. Nobody else will do it. He goes before the king and he says, I'm gonna do it. And the king says this, you are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. Something you can learn from that is that there's always gonna be people in your life that tell you you can't do something and why you can't do it. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you this, only God gets that privilege. Only God gets the privilege to tell you who you are and who you aren't. Only God gets the privilege to tell you who you can be, who you can't be, what you can do, what you can't do. He then goes on to tell Saul, hey, this happened to me. I, 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 I beat the lion and I beat the bear. God, God delivered me from the lion. God delivered me from the bear. And just as he did that, he's gonna deliver this Philistine into my hand. That's what we've already talked about in this series, recounting what God has done. Hey, God did this before. He's gonna do it again. God carried me through that last, that last leg of the race was a doozy. He got me through that one. He's gonna get me through this one. But then this last part, <clears throat> Saul clothed David with his armor and he put a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I can't walk with these for I've not tested them. 
So David took them off, then he took his staff in his hand and he chose for himself, and we cut off the scripture there because then it goes on to he picks the five stones and then he goes and then he kills Goliath and then he cuts off his head, which is actually how Goliath died. Whew, sometimes you gotta cut that head off. Seriously, the sin, I didn't say it that week, but you got a the sin, you need to cut its head off before it, before it gets you. Anyway, so here's Saul, he's a man of war. David's a shepherd, but, but David's the only one who is gonna kill Goliath. But Saul says, listen, I'm gonna put all this armor on you because that's just how we do things. We live in a world like this. We live in a world who, set, who well, we just go with whatever wind blows that day. This is good, and everybody just follows without testing it. So David said, I haven't tested this. Saul was basically saying, well, listen, kid, I know you're gonna die, but at least you're gonna look like a warrior. <laughs> but David put that stuff on. It was too heavy for him. You try to put on somebody else's calling, it's too heavy for you. You try to put on somebody else's life, it's too heavy for you, it's not meant for you. And, and, and things that come along in our culture and in our world, I love that wording, I haven't tested it. If you don't test something by the word of God, you got no business putting it on. I don't care, I don't care if the whole world says, hey, this is the way to go, this is what we're wearing today. This is what we're wearing out to battle today. If you have not tested that against the word of God, don't put that on. Don't put that on. You go by what the word of God says. Don't put it on just because it fits somebody else. Or it fits someone else's season. We're gonna be celebrating Christmas soon. Can you believe it? And some women will celebrate Christmas in a luxurious fur coat, beautiful, with boots. And some women will celebrate Christmas in a bikini and flip-flops. Well, which one's better? Well, neither one. One lives in Minnesota and one lives in South Florida. Like what? It just is. So what if the Minnesota woman is like, well, I wanna celebrate with a bikini and flip flops. Well, ma'am, you're in Minnesota. I don't suggest it. But she just shows up at Christmas in her bikini and flip flops. That's a problem. And here's the gal in South Florida. I want a Minnesota Christmas. Puts on her fur coat and her boots, sweating to death at the, the dinner table on Christmas. That's, what, that's the silliness of trying to put on someone else's life. That's her life. I rejoice that she gets to wear the fur coat and the boots. I rejoice that I get to wear the bikini and the flip-flops. Right? You get to rejoice in your season where you're at. And the other thing that has helped me so much from the Word of God this is one of those things to me, I wish everything was like this. Man, I wish everything was like this. But this is one thing that I've gotten. Jason and I call them like Navy SEAL things. The Navy SEALs, and I'm sure other branches of the military, but the Navy SEALs will train so much that they just, it's just instinct. Like they just know, not because they've thought it out and reasoned it out and can, can tell in the moment what to do, because their training kicks in. And they just know, it's just, boom, that's it. That's what they do. <clears throat> so this is one that has happened to me so much that, I mean, it's been years now. It's, I can, I've not ever heard the audible voice of God, but this is probably the closest I come. I have, I feel like I have heard Jesus whisper in my ear, what's it to you, Raina? You follow me. So you, I get this from John 21, 17 through 22. Jesus has um, died, risen, has come, has shown himself to his disciples. Peter has denied him, and so there's a reunion, and um, Jesus has asked Peter, do you love me, do you love me, do you love me? And then he gives Peter instructions. Jesus said to him, Peter, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished, but when you were old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish." This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to Peter, follow me. So here's Jesus telling Peter some tough information. This is, this is the season that you're called to. This is what's gonna happen, but you follow me. Well, I love Peter. Good old Peter, we can always count on him to say what we would have said. Then Peter, now you gotta keep in mind the humor of the Bible because the person who's writing this is John. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple Jesus loved following. 
Do you know who the j- disciple Jesus loved is? John. Talk about some confidence. He's just writing it for the whole world to see. Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one that betrays you? That's how we know who it is. Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about him? You just told me something hard. What about him? Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. I have such an instinct now, if I even get a shade of, oh, but look at her life. Ooh, but I, I can almost, I mean, I've just trained myself. I can almost hear him whisper in my ear, what's it to you, Raina? You follow me. And then I'm like, oh, yep, okay, got it, got it, yes. Because you know, we know why I'm so grateful for that? Because it keeps me focused. Because the longer my gaze is over here, the more wonky jawed I'm gonna get on my race. That's a Southern word, it just means <laughs> The more I'm gonna be stumbling, tripping, falling, going the wrong way, not finishing well. Jesus was actually encouraging Peter. I don't know why we all don't get the future handed to us like that, but apparently Peter needed it in the moment. And we needed to hear the words, what's it to you? You follow me. If you keep your eyes on Jesus, you cannot go wrong. What's it to you? Jason and I were talking about racehorses. I've not been to a horse race because I'm, it's my epi, EpiPen allergy. I'm deathly allergic to horses. Some of you in here um, have horses and I can't come to your house. Um, sometimes if you hug me, my throat will swell. It's that kind of allergy. I've had it since I was a kid. It's one of the good allergies because there's not like horses like chasing me down. Do you know what I'm saying? It's not like I'm scared for my life because there's horses chasing me. Um, but, but racehorses have blinders, right? And you think, well, yeah, because they need to know to stay in their lane and they need to know where they're going. And that is a huge part of why the horses have blinders. But there's another part to why the horses have blinders. And that is because the, the, the jockey, the master of the horse, knows that horse, knows what that horse is capable of, knows how much juice that horse has to get to the end. If you take the blinders off, the horse will be looking at other horses, but the horses are trained so well that they know they're supposed to win. They know they're supposed to go ahead. They know they're supposed to be the fastest. They know they're supposed to edge out that other horse. And what happens is they get so focused on that that when it comes time to the end, when they're almost there, they run out of juice. They run out of steam. So the other part of the blinders is so they can focus solely on the master. They can go with the pace that the master sets for them. When the master just turns them a little bit this way, that's what they do. When the master says faster, that's what they do. When, when the leader says, you know, take this turn a little slower, it's because he knows his angles and his legs and how he moves. The beauty of putting blinders on You can still cheerlead, you can still love people, you can still say, run girl, run, you're doing great. But you got those blinders on because you're so focused on the Father. You're so focused on how he made you and how he, and, and he knows what's coming up. He knows the turn. He knows that you've got a weak spot in that knee. He knows what juice you have to get at the end. He knows all of that. And when you're so focused on every little movement, you got those blinders on, you run your race so much better, so much easier, so much adventurous, more adventurous. So I'm gonna use this illustration. I'm gonna get Brooke and Danielle to come up. (laughs) Brooke's about the only other person shorter than me, so... She wins. <laughs> okay, so this is the measuring tape. I'm take my shoes off because I am the measuring tape. I got my little hair up so I get a little bit of extra oomph, you know. That's, you learn that in the South. What do they say? The bigger the hair, the closer to God. <laughs> we know how to tease that stuff too. <clears throat> so this is me, and 
this is what I'm, this, I'm running my race because I'm, I'm not measuring myself against anybody else. It's just, hey, God, this is what you've given me, so I'm just gonna, this is what I'm focused on. I'm just gonna measure up, if you will, to what you've called me to do. I'm, I'm measuring up to the light that you've called me to shine, to the, to the color, God colors that you want me to bring to this world. This is what I'm looking at. This is what I'm focused on. But if I start looking at Brooke and I'm like, wait a second, wait just one second. She's, wait, this way. Okay, so now I gotta, well, I don't have to shrink too much, but I gotta, I gotta contort a little. I've gotta like shrink some of who I'm supposed to be. I've gotta, I've gotta tamp down some things so that I can measure up to Brooke. And so I've never tried to run a race like this, but I don't imagine it's gonna go very well for very long when I'm always, and then I'm always like, oh, Brooke, Brooke. Conversely, <laughs> Danielle. And then I'm like, wait a second. <laughs> wait one second. She's way bigger, tall, more blank. I mean, you fill in the blank. I'm using height as a funny illustration, obviously. Wait, she's more than me. So I gotta do something different here. I gotta put on my big shoes. <laughs> I've never worn these shoes out of the house. This is, if y'all didn't like what I said earlier, you're not gonna like this, but. <laughs> these are my bedroom shoes. <laughs> so, get, you, get you a good pair of bedroom shoes. That's your, that's your takeaway from tonight. So then I'm like, so then I'm like, okay, wait, do I measure, do I, wait, I'm kind of, ooh, okay, now I'm kind of measuring up to Danielle now. But, again, I've never tried to run a race in high heels, but I'm thinking it's not going to go well for me. And I start to try to run in these, I twist my ankle, I fall down, I make a leg of the race way longer than it needed to be because I am so focused on Danielle. And then here's where we really get into trouble. I'm like, all right, all right. We're, I'm like, I'm seeing eye to eye with you now. Almost, yeah, there we go. But that's not enough. I want to be better. I want to be more. No, there's no more shoes. This is as high as it gets, y'all. <laughs> so then I get something just totally outside of anything that God's called me to. Thank you. I got her, I got Thank her. You. Yeah, oh, there, there I go. But now, <laughs> but now I can't run at all. Now I am frozen in this spot. Now I am completely stationary. My heart breaks for this generation coming up that is so fixated on social media um, because so many of them, but it, it is producing a hunger for God. So I will say that because they're, they're seeing so much that's not real that they're like, where's the real though? That's why we need you to shine your God colors. That's why we need you so they can encounter a real woman of God in a real season of life being who God made them to be so that God can show off and make his name great. But if we're, if we're so focused on being more, being better, not, not just measuring up to you, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, Pat, I'm gonna be better, then you're totally frozen in a place that God never had you. And you're supposed to be way down there. You're supposed to be loving the people who you were supposed to interact with and intersect with down there. But you got so focused on trying to be like somebody else or be more than somebody else or prove yourself better than somebody else or, or whatever the case may be, that you're just frozen. We talked last week about how you can't look back because you can't be frozen in a moment of time, whether it's a great moment or a terrible moment. One moment of life is not supposed to mark your whole life. You can't get stuck in any moment. Comparing yourself to people does that as well. It makes you stuck. It makes you put on artificial things that are ne you were never meant to run your race like that. And you get stuck in a moment. Thank y'all, you guys are awesome.
Sure. You don't have to take my shoes. You don't have to take my shoes, especially after I told you they were the bedroom shoes. <laughs> You're so beautiful. You're so needed. If you don't show up as you because you're so focused on whatever else, again, maybe it's somebody you know, maybe it's somebody you see online, maybe it's whatever. If you don't show up as you, the body of Christ suffers. We have people coming into our church, thankfully, every week who are looking for the real thing. And from the time they hit that parking lot, what we want them to encounter is a whole bunch of little Christs. Sonny Sandoval with the whosoevers was here and just marked me and Jason with that phrase. We say it all the time. He shared we're meant to be little Christ, little C, not, not, not big C, little Christs, showing Christ's love, showing Christ's forgiveness, showing Christ's mercy, showing, showing his forgiveness. <clears throat> so from the time people hit the parking lot to the time they see a greeter, they sit next to you, they, they, they are, they're so terrified. They're so, have you, have you, okay, let me, how do I say this? When you first came here and you weren't familiar with church, were you terrified and are you courageous enough now to say that? Anybody? Okay, yeah, see? You're, you're scared. <laughs> you're scared. And, and then you, you hit the parking lot and you uh, bump into a little Christ. And then you hit the, the greeter and you just bump into a little Christ. And then you, you sit next to somebody and they're singing and they're happy and they ask about you and they say, there you are, and you bump into a little Christ. And you, you hear this worship team full of little Christs. And then someone gets on stage and preaches the gospel, a little Christ. And then all of a sudden, they say, wow, when the opportunity comes. I've, I've seen him through you. So, of course, I want him here. If we're too busy just running around measuring ourselves by ourselves, not only is that unwise, but people are missing out on what you have to offer the world, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We're gonna talk about, so I, I just wanna keep going because I've already studied for next week. And so I know everything that I wanna say and I just wanna tell you now. When, I was, when we were in youth ministry, when we first went into youth ministry, that was the hardest thing for me to let people, to let kids leave that I knew weren't saved. I just wanted to handcuff those little jokers to me and be like, you ain't going nowhere till you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. <laughs> it's hard for me to let you leave without telling you everything that I want to say, but we're going to stop. Um, homework this week, that la the last scripture is a scripture from Psalms, but it's actually, this is your homework. It's actually Jesus talking. And if you read the whole Psalm, you'll see what I'm saying. But it says, I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me. And this is what the Lord had said to Jesus in particular. You are my son today. I have begotten you. I say that a lot <laughs> to myself. And this is your homework for yourself. I will decree the Lord. I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me. I think it stuck with me because it's rhymes and it's catchy. I will decree what the Lord has declared for me. I will decree. So I want you, this week is your homework, to declare the decree that the Lord has set over you. And a great place for that to start. Obviously, if you're reading your Bible, there's a lots of things set over you that you can declare. And of course, you know I want you to read your Bible. I was so blessed last week. Someone asked me, she's here, I'm not gonna look at her. I'll just look at the balcony. There's nobody up there. I've never wanna embarrass anybody or anything, but I was so blessed because... It's one of the first times anyone has ever asked me, you always say to read in the book of John, and I did. You know what she said? What's next? 
What do I read next? Oh, man, what a big deal. So read your Bible. I just said you can read Romans because that's, that's you know, the love of God. You can read Matthew, Mark, if that's your question too. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Anyway, so if you're reading your Bible, you have a lots of decrees that you could say over yourself. But one we've already gone over, I don't know if you can go back to it, or but it's the message, Matthew 5, 14 through 16. One decree that you, that you can decree what the Lord has declared over you is to put your name in that. Here's another way to put it, Raina. You're here to be light, Raina. You're here to bring out the God colors in the world, Raina. And on and on, and putting your name in what he's saying is if Jesus was standing there saying over you. Because guess what? When God puts something in his word, he's standing there saying it over you. And you can declare that. You can declare that with confidence. Wow, I'm here to be a light. Jesus said so. I'm here to bring out the God colors in this world. God said so. I I'm gonna go public with God. I'm gonna be a, a light bearer because I was made to be a light bearer. I declare that over myself because that's what God's declared over me. So I'm going to declare the decree that God has put over me. He's not hiding me under a bucket, so I'm not going to hide myself under somebody else's skin. I, he has put me on a light stand. And now that he's put me there, I'm going to shine, baby, shine. I'm going to shine. I'm going to shine so that the whole world can see and know that Jesus is good, that he loves you. And he wants to be a part of your life. Will you bow your heads? We're going to do a spiritual exercise in just a second. But before we do that, I want to give anyone the opportunity to accept Christ if you haven't. You know, one of the cool things about that scripture I just read where he says you are the light of the world. He said that about himself first. He said, I am the light of the world. And he shines the love of the Father. He loves you so much. He died to forgive you of your sins, to remove any barrier between you and God. The sacrifice has already been made. The, when we, we have moments like this and we ask, do you want to accept Christ in your heart? It, it's the receiving of the sacrifice that's been made. It's the receiving of the gift that's been given. So if you're here tonight and you have not accepted Christ in your heart, but you would love to, will you wave at me? I'm gonna take my time and just look at every single person. Just wave at me if you wanna do that. I'm still looking. I didn't see him. Keep your head bowed. I didn't, not for sure I saw anyone, but I always say this because we record these now. So if that's you online and you're watching next week, next year, 10 years from now, he's still the same Jesus. Still applies. If that's you tonight, maybe you were nervous. Maybe you were unsure. I want to give you the information before you leave. It's not a secret information. It's not words you have to memorize. Bible says if you believe in your heart and confessing with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, then you will be saved. It all depends on him. It doesn't depend on you. But the receiving of the gift is simply something like this. It's a surrender. It's, it's saying a prayer. Again, you don't have to memorize the words, but saying a prayer like, Jesus, I open my heart to you. Please come in, reside in me. Be my savior. I make you my Lord. I submit my life to you. I surrender my life to you. Forgive me of my sins. Help me to fall in love with you and help me to be the best me that you made me to be. Amen. If that was you, because I was unsure about um, a couple people, then, then just come to find me later. It, you, we don't have to make a show of it. I'll get you a Bible. It'll be good. It'll be great. So, if you were preparing to run a race, you would do, you know, allegedly, I've never done this, you would do exercises, like lunges maybe, or 
this or other things. <clears throat> so we've been doing spiritual exercises at the end. Will y'all come help me? So this is what we're gonna do tonight. We've got more measuring tapes. And this is just, a, this is just symbolic, right? So when you do something physically and you get out of your seat, so the idea is to do two, like hanging over the side like this, two here, one, two, three here, and two there. When you get out of your seat and, and, and you, you physically engage in something, it's, you're more apt to remember it. So I hope that you do this. Like the first week we did confetti, remember that? Um, and then, then we did the baggage, and last week we had our little tambourines. Tonight, the sim symbolic part is that you're gonna come up and we have seven, seven different lines and you're gonna, don't run with scissors. You're gonna, you can spread them apart a little bit more. You're gonna snip off a piece. So there's seven, so you know, don't snip off a ton. You know, inch, inch and a half, I don't know. Probably you could do a little more than that, but just to be safe. And the symbolic part is, I'm taking this, and I'm saying, you know what, God? I cut that, I cut that part of me off that always is looking to somebody else to validate me, always looking to somebody else to see how I'm doing in life. I don't want that anymore. I'm gonna cut that off. It's a symbolic gesture of faith that you're saying, I'm not gonna do that anymore. And then I want you to take your little piece home with you, put it in your purse, put it in your Bible. You don't have to keep it forever and ever, amen, but just, in, just until, you know, you get the message. As a reminder that God has a measure for your life, and that's all you're responsible for. It's just your life bringing God colors out into the world so that people can know him and so that you can live the adventure that he called us to. So you're about to come up here, and Danielle asked, do you want a song or anything? And I was like, we're gonna redeem that song from last week. I'm gonna tell you what, y'all are the best and y'all hung in there with me, but it was tough. It was tough with no music and a singer who can't sing. I don't know what to tell you. But y'all are awesome. If you weren't here last week, we ended with the song, Shout Unto God with a voice of praise. And nobody knew it, which made it way more difficult because it's from like 20 years ago. You, I'm gonna tell you what, you got a lot of heart though. You got a lot of heart because you sang it. So you don't have to sing it tonight, but at least you'll leave knowing what it's supposed to sound like. <laughs> so if you come up here, snip your little snip. Kind of get out of the way. It'll be a little bit chaotic for just a minute, but just relax. It's fine. Everybody's okay. I want you to stay up here. Still let people access to the, to the measuring tape and the scissors, but go ahead and come now. Go ahead and come. You're gonna, you're gonna snip it. Snip your little piece off. God, we just say that we are not gonna compare ourselves anymore to other people, whether it be the world, whether it be our sisters in Christ, we're not gonna celebrate, I mean, we're not gonna compare <laughs> to other people. a symbolic gesture, a spiritual exercise.
There's more right here if you're waiting. There's some more over here if you're waiting. Y'all are being super conservative. You can do a little bit more. There <laughs> There's some more over here. We're getting closer. Stay with me. There's more here if you're waiting. There's some more right here behind Jerry. Keep it coming. All right, we just got a few more, I think. There's some more here if somebody's waiting. Anybody else? Some more down here if anybody's waiting. I think this is probably the last. You guys are the best. Okay, you hold your little measuring. You know, I'm a big believer that sometimes we need permission with people with skin on. You know, we have permission, obviously, from the Word of God. But sometimes we just need someone who walks in a body like us to tell us, you are needed. You were never meant to compare yourself to anybody else. You are needed. It's not just that you're wanted and loved because you're adorable. Although, of course, you're adorable. Look in the mirror. It's that you're needed and wanted in the body of Christ to show his love, to show his grace, to show his kindness that only you can show. You have permission to not measure yourself against anyone else because God made you who he made you to be on purpose in 2023, living the life that he has called you to live. If you're a wife, being the wife that he's called you to be. If you're a mom, being a mom that he's called you to be. If you're a grandma, great grandma, employee, employer, all the things, all the hats that we wear, he's called you to be that. Not you to be that like somebody else. He's called you to be that. You have permission to be the you that he says you are in his word. To be the, the light bearer of Jesus. Hold on. Here's the song. I'm a great lip singer. if we could have done that last week. We don't have the words, but do y'all remember any of them? Okay. Well, we lift your name up. That's okay. Lift your measuring tape up. Father, we break off any measuring against ourselves, measuring against the world, measuring against anybody who is not you and the Word of God. You say that it is unwise. You say that it is without understanding to do that. We break that off of us tonight. In the name of Jesus, for every single woman here who has been literally just stuck on their race because they are so disheartened, because they can't be like so-and-so, or they don't measure up to so-and-so. God, I break that off of them in the name of Jesus because that is not you. That is the enemy trying to get them into a horizontal focus. Father, I call all of these ladies and say with boldness and confidence because your word says it, that we look to you. Our scripture says you are the author and the finisher of our race, the race that is set before us. So we run our race the way that you've called us to do as the people that you've called us to be. 
Father, I pray that you would bless every woman here as they see this measuring tape for as long as they have it and keep it. I pray that it would be such a reminder that you have made them beautiful, that you have made them unique, that you have set this leg of the race before them. And even when it's difficult, you are running with us. You are helping us. You are giving us strength in our weakness. Your power is made perfect. Father, I pray that you would bless them and everything that they do this week in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you guys. We made it through a night without any issues that I saw. If you saw one, don't tell me so I can keep it going. I love you guys. I'll see you next week.